Amen. So in 2 Samuel chapter 9, of course, this is a, you know, kind of a very familiar story. A lot of folks know this story, and it's a very, you know, just a quick chapter. But there's a lot of symbolism in this chapter regarding, you know, specifically salvation. There's a lot of parallels in here that we can look at and see uh, with salvation. So that's kind of what we're going to look at tonight is the different ways in which, you know, we can see the symbolism of salvation in this chapter. And right away, the first thing that we can see is that, you know, David being a type of Christ, you know, he emulates or shows, you know, some of the attributes of Christ uh, in, in this story. And that probably, uh, first of all, is the fact that he's very kind. You know, we, I remember I was thinking about as I was writing this, uh, in fact, throughout the week, I was thinking about the sermon I preached on Sunday night about the concept of, do, uh, of God. And just about, you know, it got me thinking about how we, we, we think about how great God is and how just beyond our comprehension and everything is. But that's not to make out God to be some kind of, you know, cold, distant, you know, person. God is a very kind long-suffering and loving God as well. Though he's so great and magnificent, you know, he's also very kind, far kinder than we probably can even imagine. But uh, that's one of the things, that the attributes here that David has in the symbolism is the fact that he is very kind. He's a kind king. And of course, Jesus Christ is the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He is the soon coming king. He himself is a king. He will reign as a king. So it makes sense here that in this story we see a very kind king being kind to somebody. And if you would, go over to Titus. Actually, go to Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter number 2. I'm going to have you go to some, some scripture tonight. You know, I know it's just 13 verses or so there, so you're probably getting all excited about how quick this is going to go. You know, I can squeeze a lot out of that, all right? So <laughs> just, just stick with me, all right? I guess we'll see. Maybe I'm, I'm bigging myself up too much already. But verse 1, I'll read to you. It says there, you're going to uh, Ephesians 2. But it, it said in our story that David said, Is there any is that is left yet in the house of Saul? And of course, if you remember, this is him um, not just, you know, trying to... Uh, it's not like David understood that he was a picture of Christ, you know, and that he had to act a certain way because he's picturing Christ. David's doing this because of the fact that this was a vow, this was a pledge that he made to Jonathan. If you remember, before he fled in the wilderness in 1 Samuel... You know, they made a vow that they, would, they wouldn't destroy one another's houses, that they would do good one another. Because Jonathan understood, hey, you're going to take the throne, you're going to be king. You know, swear to me that you're going to preserve my seed, you're not going to wipe out my household. So David's trying to come through on that. But of course, you know, you know he is a picture of Christ, okay, without him even trying. And it said, is there any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show kindness, show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? So what we see, first of all, the, the symbolism here is that just as David, you know, wants to extend kindness, you know, that is what Christ has done towards us. He has extend, extended kindness. It says there in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy. So it's not like just God, you know, this is just a small sliver of his personality. You know, this is just one small aspect of God, his mercy, his, his grace, his kindness. It says that he's rich in mercy. You know, he has... He has an abundance of it. You know, he can abundantly pardon, right? So he is very rich in mercy, mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. I mean, it's, it's beyond, you know, what we can understand. It's, it's, it's abounding. His great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. For by grace he is saved, and he hath raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Keep a finger here in Ephesians 6, because we're going to come back to this later. But notice in verse 7, it says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his what? In his kindness toward us. You know, God is very kind toward us. God uh, is somebody who <laughs> has a lot of good intent that he wants for us. You know, God's not just gets us saved and he's not just sitting there around the corner with the bat waiting for us to step out of line so he can crack us. You know, he's not waiting just to come down on us. And sometimes people get this idea that that's what God's like. Now, does God come down on us? Yeah, God will come down on us. If, and it, you know, if it, but that doesn't mean that's what he wants to do. He's not some vindictive, malicious God who's just trying to you know, flex on us or whatever, right? He's, he's a very kind God, you know, and he's very uh, merciful, and he has a great love. Go over to Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter number 2. There's a major aspect of God's personality is that he is kind. And this is something that David is picturing about God in 
2 Samuel. It says in Titus, we'll begin in chapter 3, verse 3, For we ourselves were also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. So it's a good thing God is rich in mercy, right? Because we were all these things. Verse 4, But after that, the kindness and love of, of God our Savior toward man appeared. And, and, and this is something, you know, so what, what, you know, what's the, what's the application, what's the takeaway from this? Is that, you know, the reason why we're saved is because of God's kindness, not because of anything about us. You know, Mephibosheth, I'm kind of, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but he really didn't have anything to offer in return. Mephibosheth was, was lame on his feet. You know, he doesn't have any great wealth. It's just David just saying, I just want to be kind to this person. I just want to, you know, show him some kindness to the house of the house of Jonathan. And he didn't care who it was. You know, say, so, well, hey, there's this Mephibosheth, you know, but he's lame on his feet. Well, can you find somebody who's a little bit, you know, I mean, he's going to sit at my table here. Can you find somebody who could, you know, walk around, maybe do something for me in return? You know, he found somebody who was lame. He found out somebody who didn't really have a lot to offer in return. And all that shows us is God's kindness, how kind. God isn't looking for something in return because... In all honesty, what are you going to give? What, you know, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? How, what are you going to pay God back with? Say, you've been so good to me, God, you know, I feel like giving you something a little back. You know, here, let me do something for you. It doesn't even come close. There's nothing we could do for God that could even come close to the kindness that he showed toward us. That's why it goes on and says, verse 5 of Titus 3, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which was shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So we're justified by grace. And that's what's always so crazy when you talk to people and say, are you 100% sure you're going to heaven? Yeah, why? Well, I'm a good person. You know, are you a Christian? Yep. Are you know you're going to heaven? Sure. Well, why is that? Oh, because, you know, I, I live a good life. And Jesus doesn't even come into the, the equation for so many people today. But, it, it, you know, you read the scriptures, it's all about the fact that he loved us, his kindness toward us, that he justified us by his grace through Christ Jesus. That, you know, it's all what he did for us. It has nothing to do with what we did for him. That's why I always kind of cringe when I hear or I read that statement, you know, I gave my life to Christ. You know, how did you get saved? Well, I, you know, I gave my life to heart. I gave my heart. My, it's like, well, I thought he did that for us. It's like you got it backwards. And I understand people sometimes they say that, but they don't really understand what they're saying. They're, they could even well, very well be saved and end up saying that. <coughs> Again, keep something in Ephesians, but go over to, back to our story. You know, the, the, the picture here is that David is showing us, you know, how kind God is. And he's being kind towards somebody that has nothing to offer in return. And as a result, you know, you know, for us, you know, being saved through the kindness of God and through the, the love of God, what's, that's just going to result in the fact that, you know, we're going to praise God through all eternity for that. We're not going to get to heaven and boast about anything that we did to get there. We're not going to get there and, and say, well, you know, I know it wasn't my works, but, you know, it was me that put my faith in Christ. I mean, I'm the one who chose to pray that prayer and believe you know, we're not going to take any kind of credit for it whatsoever because it's all by God's grace. It's all his, his kindness. We really have nothing in, to, in, to, to, uh, to offer in return. And you, know, you look there in verse 6, it says, Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. You know, this is, this is the kind of reaction we should have. <laughs> you know, this is the kind of reaction that when we come before our king, you know, that this should, should be our reaction. And that will be our reaction, even if it's not here. You know, when you get to glory, when you get to heaven, that's just going to be, no one's going to have to tell you, that's, you know, now you bow. You know, it's like, it's, it's just going to be like, bam, you're going to hit the deck. You know what I mean? <laughs> it sounded like Mephibosheth showed up and said, it's, yeah, it's about time. I've been waiting. You know, I, I remember what, you, you know, I was told me what you said to my dad all those years ago, and I've been waiting. When you, you know, it's about time somebody saw my, my better qualities here had called me to come sit at the king's table. That's not his attitude at all. Mephibosheth, and we're going to go on here and continue to read. I mean, he hits the deck, and he answered and said, Behold thy servant! You know, exclamation point there at the end. 
And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee this kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant, that thou should look, uh, shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? So that's the kind of, you know, that's the, that's the opinion that Mephibosheth had about himself. It's a pretty low opinion, saying, hey, look, I'm a dead dog. Now, I don't know that he went around saying that to everybody. You know, every, every person he ran into, oh, I'm just a dead dog compared to you. But when he came into the king's presence, when he stood before David, he said, look, I'm like a dead dog. You know, and this is, I'm not really going to develop this point, but this is interesting language that he uses here. I don't know if this is just a common saying back then, but this is the exact same thing that David said to Saul when he was hunting him in the wilderness. You know, why are you chasing me in the wilderness? You know, I'm a dead dog. That's what he said to Saul. So David, you know, he's hearing these words and he's like, well, I'm, you know, <laughs> I remember feeling that way. <coughs> so Mephibosheth, you know, it's, it's one thing that, that for God to be so good, it's one thing that God is very kind, like David is, is picturing here. But we also have to understand that that's not enough in order for pre people to get saved. People have to under, also have to you know, recognize their own unworthiness. They, they can't say, yeah, God's good. God's so merciful. Let me add my part to it. Let me you know, add my little two cents here to help me get to heaven. Right? They'll say, oh, yeah, it's all about you know, Jesus died for me. I understand, but I also you know, I keep the commandments. And it's always these just the things that people hold up as some kind of moral high ground in front of God. Well, I've never committed adultery. I've never raped or killed anybody. <laughs> it's like, great. <laughs> you know, I, neither have I. But people say this kind of thing. And they think that that's like some kind of, like they've achieved some kind of great moral victory in their life because they haven't committed some, you know, terrible sin in their life. You know, the, the attitude you have to have is when you come before a king, no matter how kind he is, you know, you have to understand this is still the king, right? And this is all a metaphor for Christ and the sinner. And the sinner has to say, you know what? I know God's good, and I'm just a dead dog. I have nothing to bring to the table. I have nothing to add to this equation. It's all by his grace. It's all by his mercy. There's nothing that we can add to it. You know, Mephibosheth here, <clears throat> he acknowledged his own unworthiness, right? That's why he's a great picture of somebody who gets saved, right? Or somebody who comes and is, is received by the king at his table, right? And, you know, we share a lot of things in common with Mephibosheth. Even if we don't sh uh, share this humility that he has here, you know, we, we, uh, we've all been min made lame, in a spiritually speaking. You know, he's somebody that, you know, had a physical ailment. You know, he was lame on a seat. He was probably crippled to some degree or, you know, and, and because if you remember the story, when they, when they fled, his nurse maid dropped him. Right. And, and he was lame on his feet from five years old and onward. So, you know, again, what was it that made him lame? Well, it was a fall. Right. And that's kind of like us, you know, and I'm not going to develop this point. There was also a woman involved in both of them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Just making enemies. <laughs> right. It was the nurse maid that fell on. It was Eve that was deceived. Right. Huh? Huh? You see what I did there? Right. <laughs> okay. I got an amen. All right. But there was a fall. Okay, maybe I'm reaching a little bit with that, but I'll admit. But there was a fall, right? There was a, this, you know, he, he fell and was made lame. Just like man fell in sin, he fell from grace, right? He fell from the glory of God. He came up short and was made spiritually lame, right? So we share a lot of things with Mephibosheth. One of them, the most obvious, you know, is the fact that he is made lame. We are also spiritually, you know, disabled, or however you want to put it. You know, we have... We have a flaw that hinders us spiritually. But also, you know, I'm going to point out here is that Mephibosheth, you know, in that fall when he had to flee, and if you remember when we preached about, when I preached about that, they were fleeing kind of for no reason. They were fleeing from David, although he'd made no threats. You know, he was taking over the king and they just assumed he was going to destroy him. But anyway, he, he, they, he flees and he basically leaves his inheritance because remember he is, you know, he is of the house of Saul, right? So he's a Benjamite. And but where do we find him in this story? Well, if you look there in verse 3, and the king said, Is there not any yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? 
And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. And this would, you know, these are Ephraimites. Okay, so he's in the land of Ephraim, which is not his tribe. So the other thing that we share in common with Mephibosheth in the story is not just that we're spiritually you know, lame, like he was physically lame, but that we've also been, we've left an inheritance. You know, we had something and we lost it in that fall, right? You know, we once as man, now we personally never had this, but mankind is what I'm saying, once had a fellowship with God, didn't they? You know, Adam walked in the garden in the cool of the day. You know, God didn't, we didn't start out sinners. You know, Mephibosheth didn't start out lame. He started out normal, physically whole. You know, we were the same thing. But very early on, just like Mephibosheth was dropped very early on in his life, very early on in, in, in mankind's history, you know, the first man, man fell and what? Lost that inheritance. God didn't make us flawed. God didn't make us this way. You know, this is something that happened to us along the way. <laughs> and it's something really, when you think about it, that didn't have to, have to happen, kind of like with Mephibosheth. You know, they're fleeing from David for no reason. David's already sworn, hey, I'm not going to take out Jonathan's seed. But they just instantly assume, you know, that something bad's going to happen, and they flee. So it, it didn't have to happen, right? If they hadn't fled, if they just kept their cool, you know, Mephibosheth would still be walking around. He'd still be fine. Same thing with us. Our fall didn't have to happen, Right? All we, all we had to do until that first woman came along and ate us out of house and home, right? You know, she, she saw that it was good and made one wise, right? And then, of course, Adam did his part and took also, and we know that story. But look, God had already warned him, don't eat of that tree, don't eat of that tree. That's all they had to do. So just like Mephibosheth lost his inheritance and was made lame unnecessarily, you know, the same thing has happened to us as as humankind, as, as, you know, to humanity at, at large, is that, you know, we have been made spiritually lame. We have lost that original fellowship that we've had with God. And again, <clears throat> you know, God wants to restore that fellowship, just like David wants to restore to uh, Mephibosheth, you know, his inheritance. He wants to give him back his land, and he wants to make him, you know, eat at his table and have fellowship with him, right? This is a picture of what God wants to do with us. And again, the, you know, the, like the beginning of the sermon is showing us that it's all through God's grace. It's all through King David's uh, kindness. And Mephibosheth has nothing to offer, and neither do we. <laughs> and you know, just like Mephibosheth you know, uh, was, was all of these things, uh, we also share something else in common with him is the fact that you know, he was made as a son, right? He was made as a son. And so are we. If you look there in verse 7, and David said unto him, Fear not, for I will show, uh, surely show thee this kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore all thy land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant, that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house, so you see this restoration, right, of him being given back what was his, that inheritance, what he had at the beginning of his life. When we get saved, we get that fellowship back with God, right? And he goes on here also, and he says in verse 10, Thou therefore uh, and, uh, and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's sons may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table, now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all the, my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Now obviously, <laughs> you know, Mephibosheth here, he, he gets to eat as one of his sons, right? But this is a picture of the fact that we actually are one of God's children. We are made God's children. So this is kind of like Mephibosheth being adopted in a way. This is almost like an adoption. Now, he didn't call him his son, but he's saying, look, you're going to eat as if you were one of my sons at my table. You're going to eat at my table continually, and you're going to be as one of my sons. You're going to have a seat, right, at my, at my table, at the king's table. This is exactly what Christ has done for us. If you kept something in Ephesians chapter 2 where we read earlier, Look at verse 4. He says, But unto God, who is rich mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, 
even when we were dead in sins and hath quickened us together by Christ, with Christ, by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together and made us do what? Sit in heavenly places. You know, we have a seat in, at the king's table in heaven. Just like Mephibosheth, through God's grace and not through anything that he had to offer, was given what? A seat at the king's table. Same thing with us. You know, God's mercy, his great, his great love wherewith he loved us, has given us a seat in heaven as a son. Just as he was made, he, he was saying, hey, you're going to be like one of my sons. You know, we are given the position of a son, you know, or I'm picking on the ladies way too much tonight, or as, as a child, right? You know, as a person, right? We are given the position of a son at, at, uh, at God, in God's eyes, you know, at his table. Look at verse, uh, go back where we were. Actually, go to Galatians while you're there. I'll just have you quickly go over to Galatians chapter 3. <coughs> he said, you're going to eat at my table as one of my sons. You know, and that's what God has done for us. He has made us one of his sons. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs of God. It's not just that, you know, we're the children of God and God just kind of keeps us at arm's length. There's really, you know, we should just be content with that. Not only are we children, but that would make us also what? Heirs and joint heirs with Christ. That's what it says in Romans 8. That not only are we heirs, but we are joint heirs with Christ. That just as, you know, we're going to receive that kingdom with him. We're going to rule and reign with him. We're going to share in that glory with him. We're going to have the mind of Christ in heaven. Okay, we're made joint heirs. You know, he's, it's not, you can see the picture here with Mephibosheth. He didn't just say, hey, you know what? I'm going to send some food your way on a daily basis. Just, you know, eat by yourself over there at your house. He said, you know what? You're going to belly up right at my table, and you're going to be like one of my sons. And there's a certain level of, you know, prestige that came with that. I mean, you see Zeba's reaction here. He's got 15 sons and 20 servants. He's kind of a, you know, probably a little bit of a big deal, right, Zeba? But he says, hey, if this is what the king's saying about you, then according to all that the king has said, so shall it be. You know, that's the same way with us. We're not just kept at arm's length. God's going to put us right down at his table and sit with us. And we're gonna, there's a certain level of prestige that comes with being a child of God, with being a joint heir with Christ. And, you know, and a lot of people today, they want to rob us of that. You know, these Zionists, they want to say, oh, and we want to make us out in like these second class citizens or, you know, the, the stepchildren of God or something like that or this afterthought that God had. No, he said that he made us heirs with Christ, co-heirs with Christ. We are the sons of God. Our spirit, bear, his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So how does a person become a child of God? And how do you become God's people? Is it through presenting a genealogy that doesn't exist? Is it through saying you have some kind of a bloodline? Or you occupy a certain geographical space somewhere in the world? It's because of the dirt I'm standing on? He says we are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That's what makes you God's people today faith in Christ and without that you are not God's people and I'm trying not to go off <laughs> too much right about that because we already did that there's a whole sermon about that just recently for as many of you have been baptized into Christ uh, have put on Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek hello there is neither bond nor free there is neither male nor female for you're all one in Christ Jesus and if you be Christ's then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You know, David was doing this for his father's sake, right? He's saying, look, I'm doing this for Jonathan, Jonathan thy father's sake. And people would say, well, they're going to, you know, God's going to restore the nation of Israel, you know, for, for, the father, for the father's sake, for the patriarchs, for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But, you know, Abraham is the, is the father, right? He is, he, is the, he is the father of the children of God, right? He, he is father Abraham, right? But who is, who's counted for the seed of Abraham? If he be Christ's, and you know, we just read Galatians 3, that if you are all children of God by faith, if you be Christ's through faith, then are you Abraham's seed, okay? And heirs according to the promise. Go over to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. As many as received him, the Bible says in John 1, 
To them gave he power to become the sons of God. You know, the difference with us in Mephibosheth is that he kind of just got to sit at the table as David's son. Because obviously this is all in, 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 the, in the actual you know, story, it's all physical. There's no way you could physically become somebody else's child. We understand that. But spiritually speaking, you know, we, it's even greater for us because we're, it's not like we're just occupying the space as one of God's children. We actually are one of God's children. We've been, why? Because we've been born again, right, through faith. There's a spiritual birth that's taken place. We've spiritually been reborn and we've become, that's what it says in John chapter 1. We quote all the time out, soul winning. As many as received him, to them he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. 1 John chapter 3. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Right? So when we believe, it's not just like we get some kind of, you know, we're not like the queen of England where we're just kind of some kind of, you know, figurehead. Well, you're just, we're, we're playing like we're God's children. No, we actually are God's children through faith. So that's kind of the difference there that we have with Mephibosheth, but you can see the similarity as well. Look at Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, behold, he, though he be lord of all. But he is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children in bondage under the elements of the world, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive what? The adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You know, our spirit, our, you know, this his spirit that's in us cries out, Abba, Father. And God doesn't say, don't call me that. I mean, I know I adopted you and, you know, you kind of, this isn't just, a, you know, some kind of little title I put upon, upon you. He's saying, no, that's what you should call me because that's who I am. I am your father. <clears throat> Crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So it wasn't just that, you know, David wanted Mephibosheth to show up and just, you know, do him reverence and, and so he could boss him around. He brought him there and he sat him down at his table as one of his sons. It's a great, it's a beautiful picture of what Christ has done for the sinner. He brings the spiritually lame individual and sits him down at a table, not as what, not as a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ, right? Not that we have anything to offer. It's all through his kindness that he showed towards us. The other thing I want to point out before uh, we move on and close here is that uh, this is a permanent position. It wasn't just like, well, Mephibosheth, we'll see how you do. You know, if you chew right, you know, if you hold your knife with the wrong hand, though, if you know the proper table etiquette, you know, if you smack your gums, you're out of here. You know, if you're one of these people that chew with your mouth open, you know, you're going to, sorry, you're going to show you the door. It's back to your, you know, it's back to Lodabar with you, you know. This is a permanent position. That's why he says there, and Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. So once he got there, it was his permanent position. If he wanted to find Mephibosheth, he's at the king's table. because That's where he's always going to be. It's the same way with us. You know, once we're made God's sons, once we're made God's children, once we've been sat down in heavenly places, that's our seat permanently. No one's going to come and bump us out of that and say, oh, you know what, you messed up, you've got to leave. You know, it's a great picture of the eternal security of the believer. Once a son, always a son. Okay. <coughs> Now, the, this is obviously, this is the very, uh, you know, what you typically hear when you pre hear this passage preached, you know, is, and, and, and it's a great, beautiful picture. I'm not trying to say it's, you know, cliche or anything like that. It's, it's, I'm not doing it justice. You know, this is a beautiful picture of salvation, God's kindness, all of that. But the one thing I want to point out before we close tonight is the fact that, you know, is that there's another character here named Zeba. Right? And Ziba played a very important part in the story when you think about it. If you go back to where we were, go back to where we were in Second Kings chapter nine, second Samuel chapter nine. It says in Second Samuel chapter nine, verse two, and there was the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And they called unto him David, and, and the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? 
And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? So King David wants to do this kindness, right? He wants to show, he wants Mephibosheth to come and sit at his table, have a seat there, and to sit down as one of his sons. But before he can do that, he's got to find him, right? He's, gotta, he's asking, where is he? Where can I find him? And he asks Ziba. And Ziba says, I know right where he is. And he says, you know what? Great. Now I know where to find him. And he goes and gets him. So you can see how Ziba, he kind of plays a part in this whole picture because what's this a picture of? Salvation, right? Of a sinner coming to Christ. But no, notice there's this intermediary between the king and Mephibosheth. And it's the same way with us. Between us, you know, between the sinner and God, there is what? The soul winner, right? You thought I was going to say Catholic priest, right? <laughs> But that would be heresy, okay? <laughs> we understand that Christ is the mediator between God and man, right? But, God, but Christ uses men to win sinners to himself, right? And I think that's a great picture here. You have Ziba, who knows where Mephibosheth is, and if he knows what the king's will is. I mean, he can, you know, bring them together. <clears throat> and this is something that you find out, find throughout Scripture, you know, and, and people want to, you know, if you ever wonder why we make such a big deal about soul winning, you know, maybe this will help you with it tonight. Boy, it seems like you guys talk about it a lot. You do it a lot. It seems like it's just one of the things you're always doing. Yeah, because it's what we're supposed to be doing, number one. But you could see how important it is. And you see that in this story. I mean, what if, what if there was no Zeba? What if, what if the king couldn't find where, where Mephibosheth was? What good would that have done Mephibosheth? I mean, King David would have been fine. You know, he had good intentions. People say, well, you know, you meant well. But it would have, got, would have been getting so good for poor Mephibosheth. He'd still be some stranger somewhere. No inheritance. Probably begging. Who knows what he's doing over there, right? In some other tribe with, with lame feet, right? He's just trying to eke out a living. <coughs> but no, this guy Zeba, you can see how important he is. Because he knows where to find Mephibosheth. He knows how to make that happen. And if you would, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We all know this passage, but we're going to read it again. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. <clears throat> Actually, uh, you know, yeah, go there. 2 Corinthians 5, we all know. I'll read that. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So I know I had you turn somewhere else, but just listen to what the Bible's saying. You can go to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19 if you want. But he's saying here, because this is the criticism we get. They say, oh, you know, we'll say, hey, we got, you know, like before the service, did anybody get anyone saved this week? Well, who are you to get, what do you mean you got somebody saved? And this always comes from people who do no soul winning. You know, they, they love to, they, they, why do they do that? Because they don't like it when other people are doing something they know they're supposed to be doing. You know, other Christians, so-called, you know, at least they claim to be Christians, they claim to be saved. Well, we don't save anyone. It's like, well, we know that, you know. We understand that we don't. I didn't come down here and live a perfect life and die on the cross and go to hell and, and rise again three days. I know I didn't do that. I know I'm not Jesus Christ. Thank you for clarifying that with me, though. Thank you for trying to make sure I understand that, that I'm not God, okay? It's a very condescending thing to say. Well, who do you think you are? Well, I'm nobody, right? I mean, who's Ziba? Just another servant. Just someone who happened to know where Jonathan was, or uh, Mephibosheth was. We understand, like it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, to it, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing the trespasses unto them. I get it. Christ is the one that did all that. He's the one that's reconciling the world. He's the one that's not imputing trespasses. He's the king in the story. But, you know, it goes on and says, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. It's like Jesus said, look, I did all the work. I did everything. It's all written down. All you need, and now I'm committing the word unto you, and I need you to just go tell them. Where's Mephibosheth? You need to go find him and tell him the king wants to have a meeting. <laughs> And wants him to sit down with them, right? So we get that God has done all the work, but you know what? He's committed the telling of that work. He's committed the word of reconciliation 
unto us. And that's what's going on in the story. It's a reconciliation between the house of Saul and the house of David, right? Because Mephibosheth is, you know, Saul's descendant. You have a reconciliation. They were at odds, and now the king is reconciling him unto himself. But how is he doing it? Through Ziba, through this servant that's there. <clears throat> Verse 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. So I know that when we go out and preach the gospel, it's not, you know, we're not getting anyone saved. But God is beseeching them, but he's doing it by us. So let's not downplay the importance of the fact that we have a role to play in this equation. That role is that of Ziba. Okay? And it's important to, to, that people understand this because there's a lot of churches out there today that are pulling back on soul winning, and you'll even hear it in Baptist churches, well, if God wants that person to get saved, they'll get saved. And they're, what they are is they're, they're closet Calvinists. They might not even realize it. It's like that's the most Calvinistic thing you could say. Well, if God wants them to get saved, they just will. And I've heard independent Baptist preachers say this. Get up and say, well, if God wants that person to be saved, then God, it'll make, he'll make it happen. Well, what does he need us for then? Well, God doesn't need us. Well, it seems to me like I'm reading here that God does need us. He didn't need us to do all the work that he did. I understand that. But he needs us to take the word of reconciliation. He's committed it unto us. If I commit something unto you, aren't I relying on you? If I say, hey, I need you to do this or that, I'm relying on you to do that. That's what it means to, to, to rely on somebody. To commit something unto them. And it says that God has committed that word of reconciliation. Look, we're not the ones doing the reconciling. I get it. It's not my blood. Okay? But it is the word of his reconciliation. I'm delivering the message. Just like Ziba, hey, Mephibosheth, good news. David wants to see you. And he, he seemed like he was in a good mood. You know? <laughs> well, you're just trying to, you know, and it's not like we're not saying that we're, we're trying to make ourselves into something. You go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to come back to 2 Corinthians in a second. But it's right there, so I'll have you turn over there. I haven't had, you haven't done a lot of flipping around today, so go to 1 Corinthians 3. Verse 5, Paul says, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? Well, who do you think you are to say that God needs you to get people saved? I'm nobody. I mean, that's what Paul is saying. Who's Paul? Who's Paul's, Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed. Paul's just saying, look, I'm nobody. I get it, but I'm just a minister by whom you believed. But uh, you know what? That means that we need ministers so that people can believe. That's what he's saying here. Who is then as Paul, who is Apollos, but ministers by whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. The Bible says that the Lord gave to every man a minister that they might believe. This, you know, this means a couple things. One, that you don't get saved without a minister whereby you may believe. And people can debate about, you know, what that minister means, but I believe it means that, you know, a, a man like Paul, Apollos meaning a preacher, a soul winner, coming to you and preaching the gospel and showing you. I mean, like every New Testament example that we have of people getting saved. You know, you, you, Cornelius, you know, had Peter, you had to come to him. The angel was there, you know, he was already there. Why didn't God just take care of it then? Because he sent a man to preach him the gospel, right? Because he's committed unto us the word of reconciliation. <clears throat> it's just so many examples of that. The fact that you need a minister to believe, okay? <clears throat> he says he gave that to every man. The, the other, so if that's true, that means this. You are somebody's minister. You're somebody's minister that they might believe. There's somebody out there, there's some Mephibosheth somewhere, to whom you are a minister by whom they believe. Don't you think maybe Mephibosheth was kind of grateful for a guy like Ziba? What he was, was he, I mean, I'm sure he was very grateful for King David and his kindness. But you kind of wonder, like, well, it's a good thing Ziba knew where I was. It's a good thing he was keeping tabs on me. You know, there's a lot of Mephibosheths out in this world today that are spiritually lame. They're strangers somewhere. They've been, you know... They've been robbed of their spiritual inheritance in heaven. You know, they've lost all that. They're, you know, they're in a bad way. 
And that was every single one of us, I understand, at one point. You know, we all play that role of Mephibosheth. We have to, but at some point, we have to become Ziba in the story. Because, you know, we are somebody's minister by whom somebody else might believe. You say, you know, and then the world, look, that, to me, that's pretty important. I mean, that's why he said in 2 Corinthians that, you know, we're what? Ambassadors for Christ. Not just, hey, you're his messenger, you're his servant. We're those things, I get it. But, I mean, he used ambassador. I mean, that's a pretty big deal. That's like, well, you would, you would call somebody in some high level of government. You know, like, I'm an ambassador for the United States. I'm an ambassador for some country. You know, that has clout. That carries something. That's important. Look, we, we're not, the, world's, the world's never going to be impressed by that t- title. I'm an ambassador for Christ. Well, make way. You know, let's roll out the red carpet for you. The world doesn't care about that. But, look, the, the, the king who we represent thinks that's a pretty big deal. That's a pretty important role when you're going to play and be an ambassador for Christ. The world might mock at it. They might, might say, That's, what, what are you talking about? It's a big deal. But, you know, we believe that we're an ambassador for the king of kings. Okay? <coughs> That's what you are. You know, every, and it says that there's, God gave to every man a minister by whom you may believe. And all I'm saying tonight is this, is that you are that for somebody. You know, soul winning isn't just for the more spiritual people at church. It's for everyone. It's just not for the more outgoing, extrovert people. It's not just for the smoother, you know, the smooth talkers. It's not just for people who can present themselves well. It's for everyone. Amen. And look, it, 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 there, the fact is that there's people that only you can reach with the gospel. You know, but maybe you might not be the, the best person at speaking. You might not be uh, you know, the most eloquent. You might not even, you know be able to, to do it as good as somebody else. But the advantage you have over somebody else when it comes to preaching the gospel is that there's people that only you can reach. There's certain family members, there's certain friends, there's certain people that are going to cross your path that only you can reach. <clears throat> so that's pretty important. I mean, Zeba seems, seems like in the story to be the only, there's a reason why Zeba's here, Right? He's, he's asking Ziba for a reason because David seems to think, well, this guy knows where Mephibosheth is. He should know. And that's who I want to reach. Didn't, you know, no, I mean, if nobody else seemed to know. <laughs> Why is he, could, could he have just asked anybody? No, only Ziba could have gotten, gone and found Mephibosheth to say, hey, this is where he is. Look, there's certain people that only you are going to reach. <clears throat> Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Almost done. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So it's a pretty important ministry, isn't it? Pretty big deal to play that role as Ziba, to be an ambassador for Christ. It's a pretty big deal. <coughs> it says in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians 4, Therefore, seeing we have received this ministry, uh, excuse me, therefore, seeing we have received this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. But we have renounced the hidden things of honesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handing the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. If we hide the gospel, are we still going to go to heaven? Yeah. Look, if you never preach the gospel, if you just live the rest of your life and never win a soul, you're still going to go to heaven but there's going to be all these other people that it's been hidden from. And don't believe this lie of, well, if they're going to get saved, they're going to get saved. That's not true. God uses man to reach his fellow man. Okay? <clears throat> if it's hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. It sounds like there's that spiritual you know, disability. Mephibosheth had a physical and he was lame on his feet. These people... You know, the Mephibosheths of this world today, they're blind spiritually. That's their impediment. <clears throat> so, you know, go, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look, there's certain people only you're going to be able to reach. You know, there, Zeba was the only one who seemed to know where Mephibosheth was. I mean, why, why Zeba then? Why even include him in the story? Could have been anybody. Right? And look, we know where the Mephibosheths of this world are. You know who that Mephibosheth is in your life. And, and there, we know they're, they're everywhere. <laughs> I mean, there's Mephibosheths all around us. 
that only we can reach. And look, maybe not even, even in the sense that it might not even be somebody just in your personal life, but it might be that there's somebody out there that neither of us know, that none of us know. We've never met. We're going to go knock their door, but they might be more open to listening to you rather than me. They might be more receptive if, you know, somebody, may, and I don't know what it is. I mean, but it seems to be that way. It seems like, you know, whenever I have uh, uh, my kids with me, people seem to soften up a little bit, you know. But there's certain people, they might, maybe they'll let down your gu- their guard if you came to their door. You know, and they're out there. They just need, they need Zeba to show up, right, the right guy. And God, God can lead. God will lead that way. I believe that. You know, and that's why I don't always get discouraged. You know, if, if some soul winning time gets cut short, you know, we have to get back to the building in a midweek service or something like that, and we're, we're talking to somebody, you know, or, or for some reason, you know, if it gets cut short or whatever, I don't get real upset if things don't work out a door or something because God knew we were coming. God knows where I was going to, you know, and I was going to highlight that part of the map and print that part of the map and say this is where we're going that day. And God, he, knew, he knows that way in advance, and he's already preparing and engineering circumstances and things like that. You know, and if people don't get saved that day, I, I don't really get bummed. Or if people get pulled out of the, you're preaching to them and they get pulled away or something. Look, God already knows all that's going to happen. <coughs> but, you know, what would be sad is if that, you know, there was somebody out there that God knows, well, if you would just go talk to them, they would get saved. But we just never went. We decided, well, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to bother. That would be the unfortunate thing. You know, and a great example of this is, is uh, just yesterday, you know, we were out soul winning up in Tempe. And uh, I was given these maps, and, and I was told, look, you got to take so-and-so back to this address because last week it got cut short. You know, he had the van pulled up. We had to go. It's time to leave. And, you know, he was halfway through his gospel, and he just said, look, I'll try to come back next week. Well, he, came, he went back yesterday. The guy got saved, right? Mm-hmm. That's what I'm saying. God knows all these things, right? But what if that person had just said two weeks ago, well, you know, if they want to— I'd go, but if the people out there are going to get saved, somebody else will get to them. Or they'll just get saved some other way. You know, they'll, they'll turn on some televangelist. They'll read some gospel tract. You know, they'll, they'll, you know, maybe a plane will fly over and just, just drop a bunch of leaflets with the gospel on it. Or, you know, or whatever. You know, they just say, God, just, they'll just get saved some other way. You know, that guy wouldn't have gotten saved. Right? Because God gives a minister to every man that he might believe. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with that in mind. So if that's the case, you know, what should our attitude be? Well, he says in verse 34, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. You know, there's some people out there, they don't have the knowledge of God. They don't know who God is. They haven't heard the gospel. And he says there, I speak this to your shame. I speak this to your shame. Now, notice he said there, there's some that have not the knowledge of God. Because God wants all men to come to repentance. God wants all men to be saved. It's not enough for God that some people got saved. It's, you know, God wants, now, obviously, not everyone is going to. But he's saying, we're saying, well, you know, we're, some people are getting saved. But, you know, God says, I want everyone to be saved. Everyone. And if we're not, if we're not doing our part, you know, this is being spoken to our shame. Right? saying, look, some have not the knowledge of God. It's not enough that, you know, you're saved. Well, hey, look, we're all saved in here. Yeah, but there's some that aren't. In fact, there's many that aren't. And if we don't do our part, you know, that's going to be a shame to us. Because, I mean, think about it. Think about David. He's got this empty space at his table. He's got all his food. You know, he really wants to, you know, fulfill his word that he gave to Jonathan. But he can't find he can't find Mephibosheth because Ziba is just nowhere to be found. Well, if we could find Ziba, he would tell us where he is. Well, what's Ziba doing? He's on the golf course. He's at the lake. He's whatever, you know. He's just not. He's 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 absent without leave. He's gone. He's AWOL. Can't find him. Well, you know what? Then that chair just stays empty. That food goes uneaten. You know, and and. That's a pretty carnal thing for Mephibosheth, but you know what we're talking about is a whole lot weightier. There's a lot more at stake here. 
you know, if the seat in heaven goes unfilled, that means they go to hell for all eternity. Because, you know, we did whatever. Because we didn't have the time or didn't think it was that important. It's spoken to our shame. that We don't want that to be said of us, you know. The king wants us to be Zeba, to go out and bring the Mephibosheths to his table. Amen. So, you know, we all start out like Mephibosheth. We all start out that way, but, you know, and it's a beautiful picture here in the story of salvation. But, you know, the, the application here is that, look, move beyond being Mephibosheth and become Zeba. Be, be, you know, go be a Zeba for some other Mephibosheth out there in the world and make them into another Zeba. Make them into a soul winner. Okay, let's go ahead and pray.